Good morning, everyone. And I'm sorry if I'm croaking. I came down with a ferocious sore throat last night, so please bear with me. The Quiet Country Churchyard in Louisa County, Virginia, has changed little since that January day in 1945 when my father was buried. There are some new headstones, of course, but the trees still whisper softly in the breezes that blow across the open fields, and the road still sees few cars. That day, though, there was a crowd gathered to honor a man who had died in the war that still raged in Europe and Asia. My mother, Jane, not yet 24, accepted the flag that had covered her husband's coffin, my brother, a toddler, by her side. I was too young to be there. Still, that ceremony defined my life. My mother soon remarried a diplomat, and I grew up in Europe, first in Italy and then in England. The scars of World War II were so obvious in London in 1950 that even a six-year-old like me demanded an explanation. So I've always known, however imperfectly, about war. And when my mother married again, a Scotsman this time, his tales of doing battle in the Atlantic against German U-boats only reinforced my fascination. I became a naval historian, intrigued by the civilian scientists who created the new technologies of war and the sailors who used them. But in the back of my mind, there was always a nagging sense that I was avoiding grappling with the cost of war. Since then, I've tried to make up for that deficiency. I've looked at the cost to some of those who were wounded during the fight for Saipan and the cost to those who loved them. In learning about how they battled their wounds, both physical and psychological, I found another Saipan, one that lived on in people's minds long after the fighting ended. This is the soft cost of war, the Saipan whose ripples were felt over great distances, over the passage of many years, and by many who never set foot there. It is the Saipan that still haunts those connected to the fierce struggle that took place on an island now so peacefully beautiful that it's hard to believe the horrors it once saw. It was one of those ripples from the war that finally led me to my father's story. When Mary Nelson Kenny's mother died some years ago, Mary found a bundle of wartime letters from her father, Captain Lorreen Nelson, U.S. Marine Corps. Lorreen had served with my father, and they were together on the 8th of July, 1944, when both were hit by Japanese fire. Laureen lived barely a week before dying of his wounds, and Mary never knew him. Her mother never remarried, and Mary grew up in a household of women. Sixty years later, she used her father's letters to seek out his fellow Marines. She found surviving members of his company who'd recently begun holding reunions, and volunteered to find others they'd lost track of. She found my brother, who has our father's name, and he, Mary, and I attended the next reunion. In Mary, I met someone who had suffered the same loss I had, and it affected me profoundly. Instead of being shaped by what it seemed like a uniquely personal history, I now saw my brother and myself as part of something much larger, something shared by many other goodbye babies. And once I met men who'd served with our father and who'd fought by his side, I was aware that our own small, privately cherished sorrow was only one of the many thousands of sorrows of World War II and its aftermath. To see where we fit into this larger reality, I wanted to learn all about Major Roger Broom, the man we only knew from a Marine Corps photograph on my brother's bedroom wall and from his glass encased medals. I found that after graduating from law school in 1938, my father fought for almost three years for a commission in the Marine Corps initially disqualified for color blindness. He was convinced that war was coming and wanted to be in on the fight. He finally received a waiver for his medical disability and then spent the next three years struggling to get out of the staff positions he was assigned to and into combat for which he believed he was better suited. In February 1944, my father took part in the invasion of Roy Namur in the Kwajalein Islands as aide to General Harry Schmidt, the 4th Marine Division commander. He hated being what he felt was a lackey and was not comfortable with Schmidt or with his own safe staff position. Better? Yes? Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, but it was not until the divisions returned to Maui that he finally got the combat command he'd lobbied for for so long. Seventy years ago, he landed here at the head of Regimental Weapons Company, 24th Marines, 4th Marine Division. Although awarded the Navy Cross for his actions during the campaign, the wounds he received cost him his life. He died six months later. During his long struggle against death, he heard from those who had served with him, many of whom had also been wounded. Their stories and those of other survivors bear witness to another kind of valor. I owe much of what I know about the fatal action on the 8th of July from Bill Crane, then a 19-year-old private, serving as my father's scout. Crane described for me the firefight in a ravine with Japanese holed up in a number of caves. Captain Nelson was hit first, and my father and Crane carried him back up the trail to a ledge where Sergeant Willio Kuntz and the rest of the men were just arriving. My father was hit next, and then Crane, as he tried to pull my father to safety and they both fell to the bottom of the ravine. Though dazed and partially blinded by his own blood, Cray managed to crawl back up the trail. At the top, Sergeant Kutz hauled him over, and Crane told him that the Major was badly hit and could not move. Kutz put sulfur drugs on Crane's head wound and gave him a shot of morphine, and that is the last the young Texan ever knew about Major Broom, Captain Nelson, Sergeant Kutz, and the rest of the weapons company. Meanwhile, in spite of my father's insistence that Kuntz leave him, the sergeant dragged him up the side of the ravine to safety, enemy bullets peppering the ground all around them. The next day, 9th of July, the island was declared secure. A medical report issued on the 15th of July at Naval Hospital No. 10 in Pearl Harbor said my father had been shot through the left hip by an enemy rifle bullet. A cast was applied and he was transferred here. Examination showed him to be critically ill. He was incontinent with a small wound of entrance over the sacrum and a very large, foul, destructive wound of exit on the left thigh. The bullet had shattered the head and shaft of the femur. He was given intensive penicillin for the raging bacteria. Laureen Nelson had apparently been flown directly to hospital number 10 on the 8th of July. Initially, his wound seemed to be the least serious among the three men hit, but the shock to his system must have been too great, and during the trip to Hawaii, he declined rapidly. Lieutenant Ed McCarthy, who had been wounded in the foot soon after landing on Saipan with the company, was already at the hospital when my father and Maureen arrived. By the time he was able to visit, the two men were in adjoining beds, both, quote, sedated but in obvious pain, unquote. Still, McCarthy was profoundly shocked the next day to learn that Nelson had just died. He was buried in the Navy Cemetery in Hawaii. Taken by boat to a hospital in New Caledonia, Crane recovered quickly. Shrapnel was removed from his forehead, his wound healed, and he was given pills for the headaches. Three or four weeks later, however, a doctor informed him that the last set of x-rays revealed, quote, what looks like a Japanese bullet in your head, and you're going stateside. Sergeant Kutz was slightly wounded on Tinian and spent a short time at hospital number 10, where he was able to visit my father before rejoining the company in Hawaii. Kutz wrote often from Maui, and he posted my father's answers on a board in his tent, where everyone came by to read them. He participated with the 4th Division in the Iwo Jima operation, and was later awarded the Navy Cross for his gallant rescue of Major Groom. Maureen Nelson received the Silver Star posthumously for his part in the Saipan operation. On the 26th of July, my father felt well enough to dictate a letter to my mother. The doctors had told him he might be able to travel in two to four weeks, when he would be sent to the medical center at Bethesda, Maryland, the naval hospital nearest Charlottesville, his hometown, where his wife and son had settled. He even thought he might be home for the birth of their second child in September. Just a few days later, however, he took a sharp turn for the worse, and a guillotine amputation was done at the hip. On the 4th of August, my father responded to a letter from his father-in-law, dictating a note to a gray lady in the hospital. He was never again strong enough to hold a pen or to write for himself. For one of the few times between his wounding and his death, he allowed himself to sound profoundly pessimistic, 
Yet even then, he could not avoid some black humor. A few days ago, in order to keep me from joining my ancestors, he wrote, they removed my left leg, leaving what they alleged to be enough of a stump to attach an artificial leg. As you can imagine, by now, I'm pretty well beaten down. The doctors are all professionally optimistic, but in my mind, there is a good deal of doubt as to the ultimate fate of the patient. If I do get through all right, it will be a long, long time before I'm back on my foot. As he slowly improved, my father dictated more cheerful letters to his wife. He also wrote his father-in-law again, with whom he knew he could be candid, giving him those details of his medical situation that he'd been able to pry out of the doctors. My left leg was amputated close to the hip, and all the bone being shattered was removed up to the hip socket. This leaves a hole about eight inches long, which the doctors say is filling in satisfactorily. Yesterday, they sutured the stump, with the exception of the hole, which has a tube in it for drainage. Further complications are that my urinary system is out of commission, and I have, a ha have attached to me a large and complicated device of bottles and tubes, which does the work for me. I was recently taken off the critical list and put on the serious list, which means I will get back okay. During my father's first few weeks at Pearl Harbor, the 4th Division had been engaged in wresting Tinian from the Japanese. When the Marines returned to Maui in late August, after the successful completion of the Marianas campaign, letters began to find their way to Hospital No. 10. In August, Bill McCahill wrote to my mother from Pearl Harbor, where he'd been assigned as officer in charge of publicity for the 4th Division. Bill, a good friend since their days together at Pan Camp Pendleton, I've been out to see my father a couple of times since he arrived a few days earlier. He's the most popular patient on the ward, both with the doctors and the nurses and the other guys, Bill wrote. They know he's had a grim, grim time and admire his smile and his humor. He's so glad for the promise of eventual recovery, the chance to see you again and the new baby. We talked about his plans for the future and how he still had his strong and intelligent brain to wrestle with the whys and wherefores of the law while spending a quiet lifetime of love with you and his family. Bill said he couldn't wait to, quote, tell the rest of the gang about plucky old Roger, who spends most of his time talking about what great guys the surgeon and his sergeant are. By the 7th of September, although still a very sick man, my father was considered well enough to travel by air to the US. He finally arrived, excuse me, arrived at Bethesda on the 20th of September the day before I was born, 100 miles to the south in Virginia. By then, his condition had declined so severely that he had to undergo several more operations. One was to remove what was left of his leg at an even higher point right of the socket, while another was to remove a kidney. He also had three or four blood transfusions weekly and was fed intravenously. The doctor told him he could be expected to be in the hospital at least an, uh, another year and possibly two. So my mother moved us to Arlington to be close by, taking my father's mother along to babysit. My grandmother was a difficult and emotional woman and had a habit of walking around the house, wringing her hands, bemoaning the loss of her son's leg, his beautiful leg. During those months, my father received dozens of letters from Marine Corps colleagues and from the men of regimental weapons. Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson of Carlson's Raiders fame who'd shared a tent with my father in the Kwajalein campaign, and who had become a good friend, wrote in October, having just heard from McCahill that Roger had lost a leg. He was sure that at some level, Roger must feel profound satisfaction that he'd made a major contribution to the success of the Saipan campaign. You manifested a high quality of leadership, he wrote, not only for the weapons company that you led, but for other units of the division as well. You're a gung-ho leader, Roger, and I mean it, he continued, giving the ultimate compliment. Carlson, too, had been wounded on Saipan, but he said he had got off pretty light. My leg healed up fairly rapidly, he told my father, but the arm was a different matter. A good bit of the bone was carried away, and I'll have to have a bone graft when the infection is finally cleared up. I'm pulling for you, the letter ended. When you feel in the mood, please drop me a line. The typed letter was signed with affectionate regards in a very shaky left-handed signature. As my father clung to life in increasing pain, he had many visitors at Bethesda, including his father-in-law from New York, who recalled years later 
that at that time they still thought they could save him. He actually seemed to improve a little until about Christmas time when he began to go downhill. On the 18th of January, my mother received an early morning phone call telling her her husband had just died. The next day, Marines escorted his body to Charlottesville. After the funeral service at the University of Virginia, everyone drove out to Louisa County, where my father was buried next to his grandparents. Soon, letters of condolence began to pour in from all over, from the Marine Corps, University of Virginia, my father's former employers, his fellow officers and men, family and friends. PFC Jean Groder had written to my mother in October 1944. He'd been one of the Major's runners over there, and I never saw a better man in my life, he wrote. The Major was hit the day after I was. I saw him in one hospital, but then they sent me back to the States, and I lost him. A year later, Groder wrote my mother from Camp Lejeune. The news of my father's death had only just caught up with him. He asked for a copy of my father's Navy Cross citation, although he thought that, quote, if anyone rated the Congressional Medal of Honor, Major Broom did. My operation was a success, Groda ended, as far as the shoulder's concerned, but they couldn't take the bullet fragments from around my spine, and they think in a couple of years it will cut my spine full cord. I imagine the Major told you, Groda wrote again a week later, that he and Sergeant Kuntz carried me off the front lines after I was hit. I had one of my arms around the Major and one around Kuntz. In fact, I owe my life to those two. In March 1945, Evans Carlson wrote to my mother in his own still rather shaky hand. His, heart, his arm had been in a cast for six months and he suffered from a stiff wrist and limited motion in his elbow. I've just heard the shocking news that Roger passed away at the hospital. I can't express how terribly distressed I am, Carlson wrote. I was very fond of Roger and I had the greatest respect for his high character and his penetrating mind. As I wrote him, I felt that the loss of his leg was no bar to a happy and useful life. I shall miss him keenly. Please know the letter ended, that those of us who may be spared dedicate ourselves to the task of attempting to shape society in the direction of that harmony and understanding which alone can end the stupid fractures of war, even as Roger would have done had he lived. The war was capricious in the way it treated men my father knew, and those he fought alongside on Saipan. After being shipped back from the Pacific, Crane spent the next year in three different Navy hospitals until a doctor told him they could not operate to get the bullet out. It had gone right through his helmet, penetrated his skull, and was firmly lodged between and a little above his eyes. The doctor said he had another two years to live at most. Surveyed out of the Marine Corps and not yet 21, Crane spent the next year drinking and fighting. Finally, he pulled himself together, got a job, married, had a family, and survived. For the next 53 years, a 25 caliber bullet lodged in his skull to remind him. Crane wondered what had happened to the men he left behind, often reliving that violent July day in nightmares. Gunnery Sergeant Kuntz survived the war and remained in the Marine Corps for the next 20 years. After he died in 1989, one of his friends wrote that he would not be surprised if Kunz's last words had been Semper Fi. Ed McCarthy retired from the Marine Corps as a colonel, survived into his 90s, and died just a few months ago. Ed noted of my father that, quote, he did not deserve his drawn out and agonizing death. The courage he displayed throughout his ordeal is the kind of courage I admire and deserves a special kind of medal. In 1946, still suffering from the effects of his wounds, Evans Carson took early retirement from the Marine Corps with the rank of Brigadier General. A year later, at the age of 51, he was felled by a heart attack. Of the 23 veterans of the Regimental Weapons Company who responded to a questionnaire I gave them in 1999, only a few are still living. Apart from Bill Crane, not many of them spoke of difficulties readjusting to civilian life but we know from the experience of today's military that many must have suffered. Gunnery Sergeant Floyd Bryant's widow reported that her husband had had nightmares about the war until he died in 1991. They had to sleep in twin beds because he would thrash around at night and yell out. And what are the civilians affected by this most cataclysmic event of the 20th century? One day in 1958, my grandmother Boom took a revolver into the garden and shot herself. She was 71. 
Years later, my aunts told me that their mother never got over the loss of her son. At 93, my own mother, Jane, is healthy and active, although Alzheimer's has robbed her of all but the most erratic memories. Of course, over the years, the ripples from Saipan have affected many islanders as well as many Japanese. But I can speak only of the direct knowledge I have of the Regimental Weapons Company, 24th Marines. Yet even this tiny sample yields many stories of another kind of valor called forth to deal with the wounds of war. The words of one of my father's very dear friends help explain. I shall always remember Roger's courage, John Riley wrote to my mother when he heard of his death. I believe it's one of the most glorious things I have ever seen. I am no witness to his physical courage to any large degree. Of that there is abundant evidence. But of his moral courage during his last six months, I saw enough to make me know that he was of the stuff of which true heroes are made. Thank you. Uh, war stories can be very per political and very personal, and the stories we've heard so far today have been very moving. Um, to start, I'd like to tell you a bit more about my larger project, at the same time as I explain my intentions for my research in general. My dissertation looks at cultures of memory surrounding Japanese colonialism and the Japan-U.S. war in the Northern Mariana Islands. I consider Japan's historical legacies on the island by making everyday life a site of inquiry. My dissertation argues that post-war dominant U.S. liberation narratives have tended to marginalize local memories of Japanese legacies, war, and post-war repatriations in this area. Um, this topic can be highly political, and I'm mindful of the pain and suffering sustained by millions of people before and during the Second World War. Uh, one important reason I'm interested in difficult colonial and war memory is to promote healing conversations and growth between Asia and Pacific populations and territories affected by the events of this period. These histories that we're all talking about here today are so violent, disruptive, and exploitative. Not for a second does this knowledge uh, leave my mind as I do this, this work. Um, thinking about history through everyday life perspectives means acknowledging that there's more to life and there is more to history than government rules uh, and economic livelihoods. Particularly in the modern period, people have more leisure time uh, than any time in history, and a lot of what gives life its great meaning are the leisure moments outside of um, service or work, government service or, or your job. So that's to say that I don't think about history as only those things which are knowable under the idea of a nation or of national affiliation or those identities you cultivate as a part of your profession or job. History is also about the networks created for personal reasons. Everyday life histories tend to look at family connections, leisure time, and the personal meanings people draw from their own experiences. This is what I mean when I talk about everyday life as a site of inquiry for my research. My interest in everyday life perspectives um, is why I have set aside the national unit of analysis uh, for this project. Although the nation state has been the organizing idea for many local memories and histories to good effect, um, it, doing this does not mean that I am anti-national or anti-anything. It just means that the questions that interest me about the past are not best organized under this category. I also explore, for example, connections between people in the region Taiwan, Korea, Okinawa, many examples have been given in other papers today about connect related experience of those populations to what happened here. Um, and I'm interested in connections uh, in history between people who have exper similar experiences in empire, war, and repatriation processes, even if they might not have a shared national origin or affiliation. 
So with that introduction, um, and can you hear me? I feel like I'm, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, I'll turn now to the current chapter. This paper makes a preliminary assessment about one of the most important issues pertaining to Japanese and US history in the Mariana Archipelago. Um, so when I say Marianas, I mean all of the Mariana Islands, including Guam. Could be, this is a geographic and cultural designation that can include this whole island chain. Uh, the northern, when I say the northern Mariana Islands, it means the Commonwealth, the islands north of, of Guam. Uh, although uh, the archipelagic war memory, or the archipelago, includes the, can include the entire you know, chain. But there's a huge differences, as I'll get into, between memory on these different islands. Um, so the Mariana Archipelago, the biggest issue uh, for me regarding war memory as I was trying to summarize different interviews that I have done with people uh, is the difference between Guam and the NMI perspectives along that line, uh, uh, the border on the Japanese wartime regime's impact on indigenous Mariana Island populations. Within all of the former Pacific War battlefield sites, the Mariana Archipelago is perhaps the only place where an indigenous group, the Chamorro Mariana Islanders, found themselves facing off against each other along the World War II um, Ac Allied Axis battle lines. Sorry, that was preemptive. Uh, so they were facing off e against each other along this border between Guam and, so the Mariana Archipelago was, the divi divide between those islands was enhanced at this time by the war. The rift caused by these islanders opposing roles in the U.S.-Japan war on the islands is still a very sensitive topic today. Uh, my concern with this topic is partially an expression, as I alluded to earlier, of reverence for those who suffered and still suffer because of this tormented past. I hope that sharing some of the facts I have come to understand about this history might help families to heal through enhanced understandings of this leg legacy of war. According to what I know so far, about 50 Chamorro men are remembered to have participated in the Japanese invasion and occupation of Guam starting on the evening of December 6, 1941, as interpreters and scouts. So this slide shows a timeline of deployments of NMI Chamorros from Rota and Saipan who served in the Japanese military uh, heading to Guam. What I know about the invasion force and where I got this information shown here is from a document that was written in 1984 and was given to me by Tan Escolastica Tudela Cabrera. One day in 2008 when she and I were looking through her photographs and memorabilia, she pulled out a three-page draft resolution including a list of several of individual names uh, of men who went to Guam. I have chosen not to show you uh, the individual names out of respect for them and their families. Uh, and instead, the point here, uh, I've made a timeline of the deployments to illustrate for you the total numbers of people who were involved in specific uh, movements to Guam. Because um, I do think it could be helpful to understand an overall picture of what transpired. Okay, so the invasion of Guam involved this invasion a deployment, especially the initial ones, right around the Pearl Harbor attack and an attack on the empires on December, in December 41. Um, it involved deployment on fishing boats. According to oral historian Mr. Herbert Del Rosario, with whom I had an interview about this, and he's spoken with many people about this memory as well, he said, quote, Tomorrow's on Saipan were put on a Japanese fishing boat with two local style canoes and went from Saipan to Guam at night. They were dropped off a few miles offshore from Guam and paddled in as if they were returning fishermen. Their objective was to cross the island and meet the Japanese troops landing the next day. One of the groups was captured by the Guamanian National Guard and the other group went through." End quote. So during their service in Guam, NMI Chamorros were used as interpreters because they could speak the Chamorro language. The Japanese military asked them to be involved in managing Chamorros from Guam because they could communicate with, with them that Chamorros were also being able to speak Japanese. 
Some Anamai Chamorros in service of the Japanese military are remembered as having beaten and murdered Chamorros from Guam. And many people remember that some of these men were sent to prison in Guam for up to 10 years for their crimes as a result of the Guam war crimes trials. In positions of authority over Guam inhabitants, the individual interpreters acted differently from one another. Not all of them engaged in beatings or murders. One woman in Guam contacted me last year when she read about my projects in the newspaper. She had a story that she did not tell the Guam War Claims Commission when they were collecting testimonies to put in a damage claim directed toward the U.S. government. She said she did not tell the Claims Commission because her story was not about damages or suffering. She told me that she wanted to track down an NMI Chamorro interpreter who had helped her during the war. This Chamorro interpreter, she recalled, had warned the group of civilians he was watching over, including herself, that the Japanese were going to murder them. And when nobody else was looking, this NMI Chamorro interpreter encouraged the Guamanians to flee into the jungle instead. This woman says that the only reason she is alive today is because of this man's action and feels gratitude when she thinks about him, although she says she has not generally shared this story with anyone but her own family. Um, her, actually, it was her granddaughter who reached out to me because she had actually begun writing about the story in a class and wanted to have more help doing the interview. So she's just coming to tell the story to her own family. So negative was the impression of NMI Chamorros after the war because of this history that it is often said that Guam Chamorros came to refer to themselves as Guamanians in a clear gesture of differentiation of identity. The military service actions of these NMI Chamorros were diverse, however, not all of them acted violently uh, toward Guam Chamorros. Uh, these NMI Chamorros represented a small group of indigenous elites coming from Japanese colonial society but on post-war Guam, uh, that colonial, colonial history and the connection to their original training as Japanese colonial police forces, many of them, uh, were forgotten. And some have imagined people here in the NMI to be untrustworthy based on the memory of the wartime violence perpetrated by these military men. In local NMI context, these men's experiences are not representative of the majority of indigenous islanders' experiences of being subjected to the Japanese military rule during World War II. And part of a lot of what my dissertation does is to reconstruct a history of the colonial period. And I can't get into um, that. It's just not time for me to explain the background of these, how these men became part of the police forces and who they were in the colonial period. But as Lisa mentioned in her presentation earlier, you know, we really should be thinking about these as historically connected events. Uh, these are predecessor conditions that led to the unfolding of events as they did. In fact, considering what the majority of Mariana Islanders were going through, it turns out that the experiences of civilians during the war had much in common across the islands. Whereas in Guam, Chamorros were made to suffer by the invading military forces, especially if they were suspected of being loyal to the United States. In the NMI, Chamorros who spoke English or otherwise had family connections to Guam or were polyglots or spoke many, many languages uh, are similarly re remembered as having been suspected as spies by the Japanese military and were persecuted because of these suspicions. Uh, the total number of NMI Chamorro men sent to Guam in the invasion included just over 50, whereas the over no overall number of Chamorros and Carolinians, not just Chamorros, but also Carolinians in the Marriott and Northern Marianas, who lived through this period of war, was in the several thousands. So the average man, woman, and child were suffering and running from a war not of their own making, not part of the elite military force. So briefly to talk about the battle that took place here, um, although we've had some good presentations that reveal many more details that I had not known. Um, briefly, I'll just say that the Pacific War reached the shores of the NMI and it really changed everything that, about what was existed here. Um, the battles of Saipan and Tinian were similar to the Japan-U.S. Battle of Okinawa that happened a, almost a year later. The U.S. invasion of Saipan started with strafing and then an amphibious landing on June 15, 1944 on the island's southwest coast. About three weeks later, they pushed fleeing civilians and, and combatants toward the islands 
northernmost cliffs. They declared their island secured on July 9th. Civilians, military, and settlers, settlers and indigenous islanders had fled the battle by hiding largely in limestone caves. Uh, it was a situation where the U.S. military said it was mostly impossible to distinguish civilian from military personnel, something that came up earlier today. Uh, so when there was an uncertainty, they would kill people preemptively as a military strategy. The U.S. used flamethrowers and incinerated uh, probably hundreds of people hiding in these caves who were a mix of civilians and, you know, combatants and non-combatants, and that's very similar to what happened in Okinawa. Uh, near the end of the battle, Japanese, Okinawan, and possibly even some indigenous civilians, likely people from mixed families, took their own lives, largely by hand grenade or throwing themselves off the sheer limestone cliffs into the land and sea. Um, approximately several hundred civilians took their own lives in this way because the Japanese military had told them the Americans would torture them if captured. In Okinawa, some people refer to these suicides as coerced or forced. Uh, moreover, for the sake of the empire's honor, wartime nationalism promoted the idea that death was preferable to surrender. It was probably mostly at this in Saipan, Okinawan civilians who were involved in the tragic final sequence of suicides at the two northern areas, uh, now called Suicide in Bonsai Cliffs in Saipan and, and uh, excuse me, Suicide Cliff in Tinian. Um, the battle was devastating on a mechanical and a human scale, and it left the islands and people severely wounded. When calculated over a period of from June 15 through July 9, during the 25 days of land battle, excluding pre-invasion bombardment, the average, an average of about 10,000 rounds per day were fired on this small 50 square mile island. 10,000 rounds a day. The number that were dead by ethnic group resulting from the Battle of Saipan is contentious. Um, the grand total of about over 50,000 people, a figure in the range of the CNMI's current population, um, is, is staggering. Because of the broad scale of devastation and the high number of lives lost, in the language of national war memory, people have often referred to the entire island as hallowed ground. No matter where you go, you can bet that location was the site of death and destruction in mid-1944. So thinking about the common experiences or everyday experiences of the battle, um, which I've called everyday war, but I'm not sure that I like that phrasing. I, I don't know if I'll keep that. Um, the most common experience of war in the NMI was one of civilians fleeing combat. Most people had not been trained to fight in a war, and although people knew that a war was coming and had been conscripted into war labor in some cases, uh, most people did not have an option to escape. Uh, however, some Japanese Okinawan civilians are remembered to have left the island in advance of the war. Uh, and there was actually reference to some ships that were fleeing it was today that were bombed before they could make it make it safely. Uh, sometimes this included indigenous islanders. I heard stories about people who were married to or otherwise part of settler families who went to Japan and spent the war in Japan and didn't see the battle here and came back after. Uh, so similar to the experience of interrogation in Guam, many NMI uh, indigenous islanders recall being treated with suspicion by the Japanese military authorities. For example, one man told me that he remembers his family's piano was chopped to pieces with an ax by members of the Japanese military because they suspected the family of using the instrument to send signals to the Americans. The people with family connections to Guam and people who were polyglots again or otherwise well-traveled under Japanese military authority often came under the most pronounced suspicion. Historian Timothy Mago wrote, writes that some allegations about indigenous islanders being spies against Japan had surfaced after the war during the war crimes trials in Guam. There was a trial held around the charge that Three Japanese army men who had been stationed in Rota and had executed several Chamorros for, quote, espionage activities in June 1944, just a few weeks before the American invasion of Rota. Uh, Mondo reports that a longtime Catholic missionary on the island was ordered by a Japanese captain to drink poison coffee and was bayoneted when he did not die right away. A handful of other Chamorros on Rota were made to drink the same coffee laced with higher dosages of the poison because they were all suspected of being friends with the missionary, while still others were shot for the same reason. And this all came out in the trial rooms. Uh, 
but Maga reports that Japanese survivors on Rota who lived in the town said they never heard any allegations of spying. And so this is, it seemed like this was something that was uh, used as justification for brutality uh, that may have been just based on uh, unsubstantiated claims. Um, so in a way similar to the Chamorros in Guam, in this case, Chamorros in Rota were suffering and being killed by Japanese military authorities who suspected them of being spies or being untrustworthy. Okay, during the war in Saipan, most Chamorros and Carolinians fled into the hills and hid in limestone caves. People who survived remember hiding in caves and scrounging for food at night. In general, people would hide together in caves with other people of similar or uh, of their same ethnic group or with people who were considered family. People generally did not hide together with the Japanese military if you were a non-combatant, although there were some exceptions to that. Uh, the caves were also places where relationships were forged that would remain relevant into the post-war period. Sometimes people who hid in caves together formed lifelong bonds based around the shared experience of survival. Uh, these experiences did then lay the groundwork for some post-war relationships and are important for understanding local memories of the war and how those remain relevant. Uh, some people, another uh, uh, facet of war memory here, some people were reluctant to talk with me about their war memories because they are so horrific and that's completely understandable. I was fortunate to be granted permission to speak with one woman who had never talked about her memories before. She told me that her Japanese Chamorro family had fled the oncoming battle on Saipan and headed northward like everyone else. I asked her to tell me about whether or not she was among the civilians who were taking their own lives uh, at the cliffs. She said no, she was not there and that she was hiding in a cave. That's not what her grandchildren told me. They heard that she was there, but that's, her story was different. When I asked her if she knew of anyone who was there, she said yes, her brother and his girlfriend had committed suicide. She told me that he, she heard that her brother killed his girlfriend and himself with a pistol in the San Roque or what was then the Matansha area before the Americans reached them. This means that her immediate family members were among those people who took their own lives instead of face surrender at the end of battle. Her reluctance to talk is reasonable. Um, she did not tell me more about what she personally experienced near the end of the war, but it was not appropriate for me to press her on the issue. I felt fortunate that she told, chose to tell the story she did with me that day on the record. It is clear that this memory has been a difficult one for her, and one that has not made it into the mainstream understandings of Northern Mariana Islanders' experiences of war history. These kinds of stories, people who witness suicide or lost family members to suicide, are difficult to share and remain largely untold and uncirculated in public sites of history telling. The lack of shared stories about this history is not hard to understand, but the lack of stories must not be interpreted as an absence of experiences. It's just that these experiences are too painful to be easily shared or repeated or become really portable. Among other things, they posed the question once asked by John Dower about Japan's defeat. What do you tell the dead when you lose? Ultimately, the Japan-U.S. conflict in the Mariana Islands is the original source of this particular history of inter-island tension surrounding the memory of the Chamorro interpreters particularly, but also uh, memories that get sidelined by the circulation of stories that are more prominent in the uh, historical record books, in the juridical, you know, uh, records. The empires and nations that brought the war to these island shores in this case are responsible for inciting regional conflicts and lasting legacies of divisive and painful memories. Rather than think that the wartime and post-war experiences of military combatants on various sides of this conflict might adequately represent history, the dominant, I would say almost numerically dominant, uh, experiences of non-combatants must have a prominent place among the accounts of battle. Thinking about war history through the everyday experiences of common men, women, and children reveals certain commonalities shared by war refugees throughout the Marianas archipelago, as well as the entire Asia Pacific region that was once under Japanese uh, imperial rule, colonial rule, and became a site of war. Uh, if memories and histories of combatants can sometimes be divisive, civilians' recollec recollections have the potential to bring people together and possibly create 
uh, new conditions or enhanced conditions for healing beyond wartime divisions. Thank you. Um, I'm talking today on really the, the theme surrounding this conference, which is the issue of culture. And what I'm interested in is not the battle for, the, for Saipan or the battles in the Pacific, but the interaction between soldiers and civilians about how soldiers and marines saw other people. And in this, space, in this case, the alien, or alien for them, cultures of the Pacific Islands. So what I want to do is to try and take the focus away from the battles in the Pacific and look at something a little bit different, something that has been touched upon by other speakers here who've been, who've been talking to you today. And if you're looking at the military side of the battles in the Pacific, including the battle here for Saipan and for the neighboring island of Tinian, they're very well covered in the literature. There's an excellent Marine Corps set of histories of the Second World War. There's a very good Army set of histories. And in fact, the Army history covering the 27th Army Division here on Saipan has very good coverage of the Marine operations. There's also a Naval history and an Air Force history. So if you're interested in the military side of the war, you have ample coverage in both official and semi-official literature. So what I want to do is to take the focus away from that a little bit and look at something different, which is the issue of how the Americans saw the local islanders and the local Japanese settlers. Now what you have here is an image of the Chamorro, the indigenous people from hundreds of years ago, and also a Japanese sugar cane factory. Because when the United States Marines landed here on Saipan on the 15th of June 1944, they were faced with a new challenge beyond defeating the Japanese garrison. And the issue here was how to deal with the local civilian population. There's been some discussion earlier about the numbers on the island. I'll give you my take on this. The Japanese garrison was about 30,000 men, which is a large garrison for an, a relatively small island. There were also between 25 and 30,000 civilians. The reason for the disparity is that before the battle started, the Japanese tried to evacuate some of their settlers here working on the sugarcane plantations, had been here for a long period of time. So they're not sure how many settlers were removed before the battle started, hence the figure between 25 and 30,000. And of course, of those 25 to 30,000, the ones who were evacuated, some were sunk by US submarines on the way back to Japan. So again, this complicates the numbers. Of the 25 to 30,000, about 4,500 were Chamorro and Carolinian, of, about, of, of which over 1,000 are Carolinian and a little over 3,000 are Chamorro. So once the battle starts, you have 30,000 Japanese soldiers knocking on 30,000 um, civilians, including up to 5,000 Chamorros and Car Carolinians, and they're all going to be caught up in the battle for the island, which will carry on until the 9th of July, when the Americans declare the island secure. Although, of course, actually the fighting and the mopping up carried on well into 1945, with a large Japanese force surrendering in late 1945. So, um, the, the, the height, the real heat of the battle ends on the 9th of July. The Japanese civilians on the island were mainly poor peasant migrants from the Japanese island of Okinawa, although they spoke a different language, they also spoke Japanese, because the Japanese had a very good public school system, which extended the teaching of the Japanese language to Okinawans. Also, Koreans were here, and they'd also been subject to the Japanese education system, so they also spoke Japanese. And the question is, how would the Americans treat these civilians? Well, I've got some quotes here from a contemporary US military observer who noted that the civilians were, quote, a novel feature, as hitherto US troops in combat up until June 1944 had only encountered scattered handfuls of local peoples, quote, semi-savages who had no special stake in the outcome of the war. So Saipan is a very significant battle in terms of interaction with civilians, because for the first time, the Americans are going to have to deal with large numbers of civilians, which they describe as an unknown quantity, and whose reactions to invasion, quote, no one could predict. The Saipan is special in this regard. And this is a quote from the Americans. At best, if the civilians remained entirely passive, they would still present a problem utterly alien to our experience to date. 
And what I want to do now is to turn to an author who's written a very famous book on the war in the Pacific and use him to pivot the rest of the paper. This is John Dower, and this is his famous book from 1986, War Without Mercy. And it's a very controversial book because it presents the war in the Pacific in very particular terms in those of race and culture. And he argues that both the Americans and the Japanese fought a war supercharged by culture, what we might call racism, and as a consequence, the combat was, was particularly bloody and eliminationist because each side saw the other ones in hostile cultural terms. Now these are some of the images, and you can see those at the back, that he presents in his book for the American perspective of the Japanese. And if you see, he has a... The, these are from uh, the 1940s, and these are images from the American popular press and pamphlets presenting the Japanese. And you can see the zoomorphic quality of the Japanese. They've been turned into lice. There's the simian analogy. They're turned into apes and monkeys. There in the bottom left, you have a Japanese uh, figure going for a woman. And in the bottom right, two images, again, caricatures of the Japanese as ape-like brutes. Now, I can't go into detail in 20 minutes on Dower's thesis, and I'd recommend the book to you. He's also written some excellent, um, has some excellent work published on the post-war occupation of Japan, how the Americans and the Japanese interacted after the war. But these are some more images, all gathered from his book. And it presents the Japanese as rapacious, animal-like, they're rodents. In one of the previous images, you saw the Japanese as a louse. They're murdering. They are like snakes. They are not like human beings. Now, Dallas' book was quite controversial because certainly for the Americans, he's presenting the American armed forces as eliminationist. He's presenting them as racist. And in this sense, the Americans appear in some measure akin to the, the Nazis in Europe, at least in as much as on the Eastern Front, there was this same racially charged war. So it's a controversial um, it's a controversial way of looking at the Pacific War and a controversial way of looking at the Americans' part in the war. So I'd like to take Dower's um, images and, and use that to see if culture did affect combat and how it affected the way the Americans treated civilians on Saipan. Here are some images, you might not be able to see them clearly, from the Japanese in terms of how they saw the Americans. Now this is not something I'll look at in detail because I haven't got time, but the Japanese presented the Americans in similarly caricatured ways. And if you look on the images that you have there, on the top left there is Winston Churchill, and if you look closely you'll see that he has horns. So he's being presented as a devil. And to the right of the picture, there's a Japanese bayonet coming in to um, obviously stab the British war leader. And above it, in Japanese, it says, India, now is the time to rise. Below that, you have an image of the Statue of Liberty with Franklin Delano Roosevelt on top. And the Japanese caption reads, Grieving Statue of Liberty with FDR waving slogan of democracy while holding the club of dictatorship. And on the top right, you have um, Roosevelt again pulling off a mask to reveal again horns on a savage uh, be, uh, human being un underneath with, with a bone through his, noise, through his nose. Very a de debauched, sort of ogre-like image. And on the bottom right, where the woman is combing her hair, the Japanese ideograms falling out read, purging one's head of American, Anglo-Americanism, get rid of the dandruff encrusting your head. And this is from a popular cartoon from Japan in the 1940s. And again, to take this image of race, if you look at the bottom image where you have the sun, in the sun in Japanese it reads the purifying sun and it's labelled co-prosperity sphere. And if you look on the left, you'll see the Japanese hand being extended out. And of course the Japanese hand is white. And the hand to the, uh, the, the local person of, of Southeast Asia uh, is brown, he is half naked, he is half civilized, and it says the people of the southern region. So, I mean, Dower takes the two sides and balances them up. I'm only looking at the American side here this afternoon. Now, before the Battle of Saipan, you have a series of other battles, such as Guadalcanal and Tarawa. 
And in both of these battles, not only do the Americans obliterate the Japanese garrisons, but they take very few Japanese soldiers prisoner. There aren't very many civilians on these islands, but on Guadalcanal there are Korean laborers, and the Americans treat them as an enemy. They seem to be physically indistinguishable from Japanese soldiers. Many of the civilians were in paramilitary units. The same thing happened on Saipan, so the uniforms are military looking. And on Guadalcanal, when Americans had, had encountered small, quote, small, scrawny, scared, unquote, construction workers, largely Korean, uh, most of them who were um, unarmed, they called them termites and shot them out of hand. Quote, the troops killed every Asian they could root out of the, br of the, of the brush. So as the American troops approached Saipan, US civil affairs officers lectured the soldiers and the Marines on the population of Ile on the island. The civil affairs officers, and the Americans would describe it as G5, they pick up a staff system from the French, the civil affairs officers organized armbands for civilians, red for the Japanese, red and white for Koreans, and white for other. And they prepared to land two days, these are the civil affairs officers, two days after the soldiers landed on the 15th, they will be landing on the 17th. But as a post-battle marine report recognized, quote, there was little of the civil affairs operation on Saipan on which the Americans could be proud. Dorothy Richard, I, I thought it would be a woman, actually it's a man, um, who wrote the official count of the military administrative services and occupied enemy territories, concurred with this, pointing to the boxes taken ashore by the military affairs officers with questionnaires, registration forms, but there'd been no provision provided for the erection of shelters or for their medical care. This is from the official history, the American official history. Quote, military government was still a relatively new concept and it was difficult to secure the proper support. As a result, the experience of military government on Saipan was not a pleasant one, unquote. The Marine report concluded, rightly, that there was, quote, a natural difference of viewpoint between the forces trying to conquer or annihilate enemy personnel, 30,000 Japanese, about 94% of whom are killed, the forces trying to annihilate and destroy all property which might be used by the enemy, and forces trying to conserve property which might be beneficial to an alien enemy civilian population. This, in a way, was war without preparation as much as, much as it was war without mercy. Now, if you read the contemporaneous American accounts of the Saipan battle, most of them focus on the war. And if you look at them and subsequent official and semi-official histories, often written by former servicemen, they skate over the uncomfortable issue of the civilian's experience of battle on Saipan and on Tinian. They much prefer, understandably, to focus on the glory and heroism of the unfolding battle, issues that have been discussed in papers here today. This is understandable considering the audiences and the authors for whom, the, the authors and the audiences for whom they were write, which they were writing. The civilians appear tangentially, and in the um, bump, the blurb that you've got for your um, the conference, one of the things that you'll see is an image of a soldier handing candy through the wire of a stockade to a, um, a small uh, a child, a civilian child. The soldiers and the marines are presented in a very minor way, treating civilians, and in a positive way. The one exception when it comes to the civilians on Saipans does not deal with the Americans, but it deals with the Japanese, and of course what it deals with is the issue of the suicides at Marpee Point at the end, the northern end of the island. Now, the suicides at Marpee Point are presented as caused by the Japanese, and, and rightly so, but they, they, they were in some fashion. People were shot, people committed suicide, their gruesome end was recorded. We, some, we saw some of the images earlier, and they were presented as proof as an, an unavoidable, sorry, as an avoidable tragedy perpetrated by a fanatical suicidal opponent. So civilian deaths are either unavoidable or attributable, attributable to the Japanese killing their own people. Well, is this true? Well, as I stated above, a small part of the American Civil Affairs Unit landed on the 17th of June, but it was a number of days before all the Civil Affairs men were ashore. There were never enough of, enough of them, they never had enough equipment, and they were always in the back areas of the troops chasing the fighting up the island. They establish a camp, this is an image of the camp, but Camp Susupi, very near here, 
and they concentrated civilians initially in the beach area, the ones they, they, they found, dangerous and unsanitary and without shade, but then once the troops had pushed up the island, the Americans set up the permanent camp at Susupi, where the Americans triaged the civilians, and the Americans knew then and preferred the Chamorros and Carolinians. They kept them apart from the Koreans and the Japanese, and one of the uh, images you'll see on the bottom right is a picture of a ship which was used as part of a repatriation process where all the Japanese, all the Okinawans, and all the Koreans were taken back after the war. So the Americans did have some idea of some friendly population in the form of the Chamorros and the Carolinians. Now, considering the exigencies of the war and the Americans' lack of experience, the US forces did what they could for the non-combatants who were fleeing the fighting. The Americans focused on winning the battle they were poorly prepared centrally, they were indifferent on the battlefield when it came to the care of the mass of the civilian population. Now, Chamorros and Carolinians were usually more willing to surrender to the advancing Americans, and they tended to do so early in the battle in the southern part of the island. Japanese civilians, and again this has been discussed earlier in some very interesting papers, were convinced that the Americans would rape and abuse them, quote, punch out their eyes and cut off their noses and pull off their legs and arms. Fearful Japanese civilians fell back with the Japanese troops as they retreated north, one tale being told that black American, quote, Negro troops would abuse Japanese women. The Japanese were told that to join the US Marines, a recruit had first to kill his mother and father. The Americans were an alien, unknown force. I uh, interviewed one um, local Chamorro who, as a boy, was told that the Americans would be eight feet tall, would be wearing pressed pants and white stockings. So if the local islanders are alien for the Americans, the Americans are alien for the local people. Now, the Japanese did kill their own people. You can't avoid this. And even without soldiers present, Japanese parents killed their own children, their spouses, often cutting their throats. Children will be bayoneted. The problem for one of the very few Japanese soldiers who surrendered was escaping his comrades rather than the reaction of the Americans. And there's a, a good account of how he finally comes across the Americans and is actually treated very, very well. Um, he just says, their Japanese was a little shaky, but I feared that if I surrendered within sight of our own men during daylight, I might be shot in the back. I couldn't actively say, let's surrender, because I was worried about what that young man might do. The American army was only a little way off. When I'm spotted by them, I thought, I have only to raise my hands immediately. And when he does surrender, he's treated very, very well. The Japanese authorities were not prepared for the US invasion of Saipan. They portrayed the US force as brutal. They encouraged civilians to retreat with the battle, and they killed many civilians who refused to kill themselves. But civilians were not forced to retreat with their troops. They did so because they were genuinely scared of the Americans, not helped by the appalling carnage that surrounded them. This can be forgotten when the civilian experience is reduced to the suicides at Marpy Point. And Marpy Point, very famously, a sniper shot a woman holding her baby as she was running frantically to and from the precipice. At the same place, Japanese soldiers had children in circles throw live grenades like balls. All this was made easier by Japanese notions of honor relating to surrender that civilians as well as soldiers seem to have imbibed. In the end, some 10 to 12,000 of the 25 to 30,000 civilians on the island died, including about 1,000 of the local Chamorro and Carolinians. Now this is interesting because the Chamorro and Carolinian um, deaths are about 25%, the Japanese deaths are a little bit over 40%. Now, on the assumption that the Americans could not distinguish in battle between a Carolinian, a Chamorro, a Korean, an Okinawan, or somebody from Japan, this means that the Chamorros and the Carolinians must have been more willing to surrender than the Japanese, otherwise you'd have sim similar ratios of dead civilians. How many of these civilians, 10 to 12,000, committed suicide as opposed to dying as collateral damage, to use an awful euphemism, is not clear. But my argument is that the suicides at Marpy Point, while dramatic and recorded by US film crews, as you saw earlier, probably did not claim that many lives. So this is the traditional story of the tragedy of the civilians on Saipan, buttressed by counts of honorable Marines and army soldiers trying to avoid needless suffering, and who are horrified by the carnage, not just at Marpy Point, but at so many caves that they came across full of suicides as they pressed north up Saipan.
But I would argue that the Americans are also responsible for civilian deaths, if inadvertently, and John Dower here has a point. So just to wrap up, firstly, the American tactical system, and this has been discussed earlier, had a big part to play in what happened to the civilians. And of course, you had an image of a flamethrower here earlier. Uh, napalm is used for the first time on Saipan. Flamethrowers and these sorts of weapons are indiscriminate and targeted Japanese, Koreans, Chamorros, and Carolinians who are hiding in spaces that the flamethrowers uh, would reach into. And many of the Carolinians and Chamorros built underground bunkers, which of course the Americans had no idea who was inside, so they'd use a weapon system, a tactical method, that would um, lead to civilian deaths. And the second issue, and I could talk more about this afterwards if you want, is the question of language. Um, the Americans simply didn't have enough Japanese speakers, and this links in very nicely to Damien's talk this morning with Guy Gabaldon, uh, enough speakers, uh, Japanese speakers, to be able to communicate to the Japanese civilians. That said, the, some of the Chamorros through the Spanish um, Catholic priests spoke Spanish, and some of the Hispanic servicemen, American servicemen, could communicate to them in Spanish. But for the US servicemen, up against a hidden enemy in fluid battlefield situations, he's, he only has a few basic language phrases if he's remembered them from his training days. Put up your hands, don't be afraid. And of course civilians hearing his own language or her own language spoken in a very alien tongue is not necessarily likely to encourage them to come out of the cave. So US troops approaching a cave complex had a choice of either going in to find out who was hidden inside, trying to talk the occupants into surrendering, or using a flamethrower or a satchel charge to deal with the problem. Now before the 9th of July, the preferred method was to seal the cave, another euphemism for killing the people inside. After the 9th of July, when tempers calm, more verb verbal persuasion and more Japanese-speaking Americans, both um, Japanese Americans and officers who'd been taught to speak Japanese, were used and the numbers of civilians go up. So, for the Battle of Saipan, the Americans did have a skeletal, did have a skeletal civil affairs staff and they did have some understanding of how to treat enemy civilians, but they lacked a will seriously to take up the problem of the civilians caught up in a war zone. We might characterize as a psychological as much as a material unpreparedness. US forces focused on combat and destroying Japanese military forces. So battlefield callousness, poor operational preparation, and intense combat on a small island, and both sides seeing the other in ideological racist terms, were responsible for civilian deaths. The two explanations are not mutually exclusive. Japanese national ideology, culture, and notions of honor explain why many civilians chose to kill themselves and why Japanese soldiers helped them to commit suicide before committing killing themselves. Americans also saw their enemy in ideological terms. I think John Dower is right. And this explains why they paid such little attention to civil affairs on Saipan, underpinned the attitudes of their fighting men, leaving it to the troops on the ground to decide what to do with civilians. Thank you very much.